Hello. Welcome to Lower Master's Lair. I'm your Lower Master, here for another region of the Inner Sea region. It has been a few months, has it not? Either, either way, today we are continuing our desert exploration into a nation which is not its own nation. Kadira, the westernmost satrap of the Padashi Empire of Kelish. I'm that's the only time I'm going to say Padashi. The rest of the time is going to be Empire. No more messing around. Well, yet anyway. <laughs> let's get started. First, let's go through the region's history. Because of the climate, Kadira had only scattered peoples. There are ruins of old cities across the region, but the largest concentration is around the capital, Cantia. Cantia, in fact, might have existed since before the spread of the Kelish into the area. Eventually, the spread of the various ethnicities which had united into the Kelish spread into the area, while Gurundi and Rani settlers coming from came into the region from the other direction. However, what would settle the region's future was Cantia's famed horse races which attracted more and more of the Kelish to the area, until they took the region for themselves. Of course, horse racing, horse racing was just what brought the Kelish to Kadira. The reason for conquest was trade. The Golden Road, stretching across Kazmaroon, already had access to ports in two continents. Adding Kadira would officially bring Avastan and go on into the fray. And so it was negative 43 AR when Kadira first became a satrap of the Empire and began the first 1,500 years of fighting with their neighbor Talon, the first of many conflicts between the two countries. During this time, the position of satrap was made a hereditary one on the condition all foreign affairs of the satrap were handled by an imperial appointed vizier. Over the years, Kadira has managed to expand its influence to Assyrian and the mainland, until Karapesh made the mainland independent. A massive earthquake in 2920 AR was used as justification to try to start a war leading to the imperial crown stepping in for more direct control for about a millennium, intending on having the country focus on trade, not war. However, in 4067 AR, a succession crisis in the empire led to all the nobles and even the vizier being away, which Kadir used as an opportunity to re-establish war against Taldor just as they were having to worry about Cheliacs and the even-tongued war. The war between the two nations would last for 500 years to 4603 AR. Now that the nation continues to build its trade, re-establish pe peaceful relations with the nations of Gurund, and skirmishes intimately with Talbot. Which brings us to the people. Along with another ethnicity of human, the Kelish. Or ethnicities. That's right, we are finally doing an ethnicity which is actually multiple rolled into one by not all Avistanians. I mean, the Kelish also talk about how united they are, and they still have some commonalities between them. They tend to have tan skin and dark hair, because much most of the empire is desert. They are dressed in loose clothing and wear coal under their eyes. Being people of the desert, hospitality is a way of life, and they find denying anyone who requests them food or water to be the greatest of taboos. Speaking of food, it tends to spoil fast in the desert, so the Kelish have adapted to heavily spiced food as a center of their diet. They are known to be polite. To the point their insults sound more like poetic verse to other people. 
And as business people, haggling is an art. If you do not haggle for wares at a shop, it might be taken as an insult, my friend. As for individual ethnicities within the subheading of Kalish, the people believe the empire is graced by six main tribes. The Althamiri are the nomadic conquerors whose laws and clothing style provided the base of what is known today as Kelish. Their close cousins, the Sohii, still prefer to herd and farm and refuse to enter cities except for trade. When they conquered the Aishmaria people, the Kelish are said to have learned of art and beauty before the Ashmeas. Ashmeas faded into other bird lines. The Shota Katibi live in the jungles in the southern portions of the empire, and were the first to establish the Golden Road trade route, establishing trade with TNZ, Rudra, and Grand. Meanwhile, for most of their existence, the Medians were with the Katibi and were the ones who established some of the oldest trading systems and oldest banks on Galorian. Finally, the Susanams are wanderers who have the innate ability to sense water in the desert, but become very sick if they are away from their mother the sea for too long. Smaller groups including small mix of Gurundi, Tien, and Rudrani in the blood from trade, Julanas and their trade of rare, rare wood, which the Kalish keep a monopoly on, another cousin of the Elthmari, the Kara, are still today desert raiders. There's also the rena remains of the Nishburians and Yem Chaburian people, both lost empires, and the uh, Beshemans and Mishirians, but are cultures who are devoted to Moloch and Thalania, respectively, among various others. Hopefully, we can add some specifics on some of these whenever the Age of Lost Omens turns their eyes in the Golden Rose direction. For other ancestors who live in the Satrap, Clerks, as I mentioned, in their recent video, have an ethnicity called Parahines that we have heard a little about, only that which basically boils out that there are bladesmiths who live in the capital of Kathir. Elves are also treated to the level where they are considered to be able to be, apply for citizenship if they sort of desire. No one's passed through as always, and halflings either are servants or slaves, unfortunately. <laughs> Poor halflings. Anyway, genie kin, as with most Kellish countries, with their genie binding roots, are looked down upon by Kadir. While the worship of Sanre has allowed Azamars to receive the highest of glories. For other smaller ancestries, those associated with darkness or trickery are not exactly welcomed by the followers of the goddess of sudden truth. Humanoids with animalistic features are treated as more mere curiosities instead of as equals. And races from other planets, well, another opportunity for long distance trade, am I right? Looking through the government of Kadira, again, it is not its own nation but part of an empire. The leader of Kadira is the Kelish Emperor, Kelish the 22nd. When it comes to just leading Kadira itself, the leader is a satrap, the current being the war ready Zorbister II. However, he is constantly watched over by the Imperial Vizier, who is fully loyal to Kelish over Kadira, and makes sure that the satrap does not step out of line. Below them, noble families are the only ones who can own land across the Kelish Empire. Even the Emperor needs to be careful on stepping on too many noble tolls, but individually the satrap can tend to their needs. For military, 
There is one supreme commander appointed to the emperor, appointed by the emperor, eh, appointed by the emperor, and two branches, the satrapian guard and the imperial forces. The satrapian guard has one commander assigned to each satrap, while the imperial forces has thirteen, which commands one section of their military. Which, listing them all for fun, light cavalry, heavy cavalry, light infantry, heavy infantry, navy, ranged, recon, intelligence, majors, engineering, medicine, air, and clergy. Speaking on the intelligence agency, we have been given a bit of it in the past with the group, called the Hatherat, Hatherats, and their goals of secretly protecting Kalish interests abroad. But I do not think we should need to cover them today until we get more information on the other branches, so. However, there is one group which are exalted in Kadira and have no connections to the Chelish, the Peerless. However, since they are not officially part of the government, let's call this today's first side tangent, the part of the show where those of true worth are rewarded. The Peerless are advisors chosen by the satrap of around 20 of the greatest generals, artists, scholars, and merchants. They are chosen to be called to assemble when the region is in crisis. However, this, the nation is currently ruled by a warmonger who is not allowed to go to war. So they mostly spend their days as adventurers doing odd jobs for the satrap. We have four examples of Peerless and how they became famous. We have a treasure hunter who uses his deafness to avoid harpies. A mysteriously scarf-wrapped being, scarf being who saves children from sandstorms. An illusionist who single-handedly turned back a knoll invasion. And a pirate captain slowly clearing out the nation's moss-infested islands. Adventurers indeed. With all that said, let's go through the different regions of Kadira. Again, Kadira is not a nation itself, but part of another nation. So like other nations we have covered, there are not individual rulers of each of the regions. However, the information we do have, well, honestly, the information we do have is kind of scarce. So this might end up being an overall shorter than usual. Or it would give me more time to go over bits of information I would normally be forced to overlook for time's sake, but <laughs> either way. First, the plains of Peresh. The northern coastal gla grasslands, not glasslands, grasslands, which is the major population center of the nation. It was originally home to nomadic people, and while some have mixed with the Chelish, many still herd and raid in the area. This is also the home of Kantir, the capital of Kadira. This is also, the center of the people most looking to start a war with Taldor, despite the wishes of the Emperor. Continuing across the Taldor border, we have the northern Zo mountain region. This is the poorest re region of Kadira. As the name implies, a mountainous region with sparse population, lacking in fertile land, and no reason for traders to pass through. One of the most important actual towns is Namat, a traveling encampment of, uh, well, they consider themselves healers, but the outside tends to only think about them as courtesans. Here, many worshippers believe that physical ecstasy can lead to a spiritual one, and follows the likes of Calistria, Shailen, Sanri, and Arshie, uh, gather to do their part. Speaking of worship, this is also the location of the Pure Ones, part of Seren Ray's faith. While others experience the outside world and are first to live with it, those within the Sun Hill Monastery, mostly Asimars, make it their pur purpose to isolate themselves, 
So when a dispute rises within Sanrei's faith, they may act as neutral arbiters. Which brings us to our second side tangent. Most of the Asimov's Indipure ones are Peri blood, so let us look at what Peri are. On our world, Peri are a winged trickster figures from Persian mythology, where they are known for their beauty and their torment by the evil divs. It was also here they started that it started that they were creatures who were denied paradise until they atoned for past wrongs. With the spread of Islam, these creatures were made synonymous with good jinn, and similar but different from angels. In Pathfinder, we unfortunately have not been given as much information about them as other celestials because we're we'll focused on the fiends, but but we have them knowledge that they are fire-winged angelic beings, which have some demon blood in their veins, and that they are celestials continuously working to pay off the evils of their family. Next is Pashman, a mountainous region between the northern and southern Zoe Mountains. This is home of the main pass which allows travelers of the Kellish trade of caravans of Kellish traders to the ports of the nation. One of the main towns in the region is Koka, a town on the border where those who are traveling into the Kellish Empire have their last chance to trade away the goods of their caravan before finding themselves forced to pay the heavy tax laid upon non-citizens. However, the mountains are also home to a variety of temples and ruins full of treasure. And Harpy's way to throw greedy adventurers out of their territory, or set the mountains off their territory. Next city in between the Zoe Mountains and the Ketz Desert is Tupa. This region is one of dense forests and is divided into two halves. The north hosts most of what one thinks of as a woodlands, and is considered a safer spot to settle. The south, in comparison, is more of a dense jungle, and is filled with various wild animals. They both have the sediments, however, and both send out a steady supply of wood and fruits to the rest of the region. Of all the territories of Kidara, this is the one that is the least interested in the central politics of the region, and likewise much of Kidara thinks of this section as backwoods in multiple ways. The Kent's Desert is what one thinks of when they think of Kedar, a rolling desert filled with beautiful sand. Of course, this region is, also has semi-arid savannas and actual grasslands, but the tourists do not need to know about those. In the center of the desert is the village of Ahir, home of the embassy for Jinikin, where Jini and Jinikin, who are abused across Kedar, can find protection. Elsewhere in the area, one can find a city which protects a temple of Pazuzu, and a temple said to hold the secrets of eternal youth. Off the coast is Yadimir Island, home to the naval port of Merev, one of the strongest bases in Kidara. To the south, we get into the southern Zoe Mountains. This is the section of Kedar which has the least population density, just being a scattering of small villages. This is home to dragons, sphinxes, and other dangerous monsters, which are not seen in the satrap at large. This place is home to the creatures known this place is also known home to the creature known as the mouthpiece, a blind cyclops with the power of prophecy and a secret advisor to the leaders of the nation. It's also home to the mysterious Leth River, which like its namesake erases the memories of all those who drink it. On the west coast sits the border of Kashmir, sitting on the border of Kashmir, we have Mahareb, 
Despite the mountains and desert of Rosa Kidar, which makes the photo of the region, this is both home to a fertile farmlands and lush jungle. The Mahariv jungle is the largest unex is most unexplored due to the density of the carnivorous plants and oh you know, Pliptoff. Yeah, whatever is actually in there is something one does not want to know. Either way, despite it being part of Kadira, it much more sees itself as part of the main Kelish Empire. Next, on our way south, we have the Merez Desert. With the vast grassland and terrible beings known as the Heralds of Dust, caused the entire area to wither and die, leaving little but a desert and skeletal trees. It is home to scattered camps and ancient ruins. One place which stands out is Jazona Oasis, home to a clan of desert giants, granted imperial citizenship for the purpose of protecting caravans passing through the region. And of ruins, the most famed is Kumarin, Kumarin, a city said to be cursed, potentially containing documents of angels and or devils, and being holy to the lost goddess Shahar. Eh, I'm tripping over my words today. Those few who have explored the ruins have come back half mad, rambling about and not bringing the appropriate gift. This land is also known for being the home of the Al Zabriti, a tribe of Al Thamiri who are in charge of training the famed horses that people are known for. They tend to look down on their city we can came, living their lives as desert nomads, building compounds close to several races, allowing others to stay out of hospitality by keeping them away from their prized horses. By the way, this is a side tangent. <laughs> Hearses which are said to be blessed with the blood of genies. Druids like Sun Riders allow themselves and their allies to easily travel through the desert. Horse lords are important like cavalry, allowing one to move rapidly across the desert, striking an enemy with their, as their mounts pass. But the genie touch horses are reserved for those who have mastered the fighting style known as Ashavir. They are able to coordinate and encourage their allies, and their, their charge can both distract their opponents as well as cut them down with deadly efficiency. Finally, the southernmost area of Kadira is the Alavar Peninsula. This region is mostly desert after a div moved in, bringing with them desertification, bearing various ruins including a temple dedicated to Moloch. This, however, does not include the Emerald Coast, which is a fertile southern coast, which has enough farmland to support various desert decent-sized city, ci uh, decent cities. It also includes, however, the Minotaur Islands, various perilous islands off the southern tip. This includes Alogarkil, home of a temple to Mathahala, Dagon's fame, location of a temple to Dagon, as you probably guessed, and Spider Island, which, well, the name. All in all, places you do not want to sail to alone. Finally, a matter of faith, a relatively easy topic actually. Well, other regions have multiple faiths working in concert or being for worship. The Empire of Kelish is fully devoted to one deity, Sanre. It is said long ago, the various tribes of the Kelish people needed a, a, to petition demon lords and evil gods to survive. They called out to the sun, asking how it could look down on such injustice. And one day, the sun answered. 
Since then, the Kellish have devoted their loyalty to Sanre. I already have a video on her, but there is one thing worth mentioning. Over the years, the followers of Sanre's main church have broken into two separate faiths. The traditionalists, who followed the goddess's call for peace, and the cult of Dawnflower, a young, more martial split of faith. However, while the faith in Sanre is the official faith, many small philosophies and forgotten deities who call this region home. Most, but we we have but a paragraph for. So let's use this as a side tangent opportunity. The final one for the day. Just to list them off, of course. First, some of the gods we recognize. The Temple of Law, which treats the legal profession as a priesthood and worships the trinity of Avatar, Asmodeus, and the imperial lord, ephemeral lord, Zolz. And the Usage, from Tuvia, the ancient worshippers of, of the Div demigod, Ayamon. For the small gods whose names still echo in the modern day, Arthur Shimayan, the name in the wind, is said to have been the bringer of horses to the region. Lugal Shimaru, the palm tree king, is an old Kajmaru deity who guards oasises. Orthos, the Everlast, is a Kajmaru moon god who is reimagined as the lover of Sanre and defender against chronic illnesses. Roridira, the dark sister of knowledge, has called us to claim knowledge of the world's truths and which appear to outsiders as mere madness. Sahar, as mentioned earlier, is a deity we do not know anything about, besides the fact that those who try to find out more about her suffer immensely. Bali, Yahia, the cry of the wastes, is a deity who gives children to childless couples for price. Now, Finishing off with philosophies and worshippers of unknown gods, the cult of the hawk is a combination of Kadirian and Osirian mythics who have gained decent regional power. The dust speakers are spreaders of misinformation and confusion. Nightseers are said to be able to hear the wisdom of the unknown god, whatever that wisdom actually is. Kejdashimon is a monistic philosophy which helps people with their intimacy. Finally, the White Feathers are a group of pacifists preaching in a war-loving nation. I pray whenever we do get the Golden War Road Lost Omens book, we get more information on these deities. But for now, this is where we will be first to put a pin then. And that is Kadira. Hopefully we will be able to look more into the Empire of the Kellish one day. Heck, a deeper look into Kaj Moon in general would make my day. Either way, we will be looking into something interesting for the next month. Plus, I also wish to mention I am finally moving. These last few have been pre-recorded for my two weeks of travel and setup, which is why I'm going with this messed up take instead of actually a better take I try to get. So I also do not, at this time, I have not been able to get information on galactic magic yet. I hopefully will be able to go through all of that before I next, before I next need god information. But for now, I'll see you all on the other side. Take care.